surgery at uh, the University of Washington in Seattle. He is a, the uh, Spine Fellowship Director. He's also the current uh, Chairman of the Education Committee of AO Spine and, and really a true surgeon educator. And, and I mean that. I've been following his work for a long time. He, he and a lot of his colleagues put together some of the best uh, training courses and, and uh, webinars and really in-person conferences for residents and fellows. Uh, he's an expert in spinal trauma, and I know this is a very popular topic, and there really isn't uh, a more qualified person, more qualified educator than, uh, than Rick to uh, be with us and, and showcase some of his cases. So Rick, thank you very much. Welcome to our program. And uh, we'll go ahead and, and have you show your screen and, and get started. And thank you for joining us. Well, thank you, Ali and uh, Ali. And <clears throat> let me know, um, at, uh, this should be fun. Uh, when I asked what sort of cases to show, I was instructed to show not the routine stuff, but a little bit of the unusual. So I think none of these have a right answer per se, but um, hopefully we'll prompt some good discussion as we kind of look at these. So um, hopefully everybody can see my screen here. And uh, is that coming through okay? All right. So I titled this kind of unusual cervical trauma cases. Uh, again, these are not the generic that come every day, but I think, you know, hopefully at the heart and soul of everything, it comes down to principles and we can apply those principles uh, no matter what sort of trauma we're looking at. So here's my disclosures. Um, we do have some fellowship support. I get a couple of teaching honorariums, but uh, when it comes to these particular cases and the type of implants, there really should be nothing relevant. I'm not gonna talk about particular implants in any way. So these are the three trauma cases that uh, I, got, I prepared. One is a C1 fracture. Uh, one is a unusual cervical jump facet type injury or a, a AOF4. And then cervical thoracic fracture with kyphosis that had a delay in diagnosis. And so I'm, I'm interested to see, I can, I'll show you sort of what I did with each of these, but uh, I think that there can be multiple right answers to these. So this first case is a 29 year old, he's a professional American football player. So NFL for those in, in the US, for those outside the country, a uh, kind of a big deal here in the US. He has a head on collision. Uh, interestingly, he walked off the field with severe neck pain and with all the criteria that the NFL is supposed to, to follow, he was sitting up um, kind of minding his own business and was sort of left to his own accord. Um, big guy, six foot seven, uh, 340 pounds, uh, roughly equivalent of 201 centimeters, 155 kilos. Um, as most NFL football players are, he's otherwise healthy, uh, except for he's a very big guy and has no motor sensory deficits, uh, just significant neck pain. These are his initial images uh, that came through. Um, I don't know, Ali, if you want me to interpret them or if you want me to leave it open. Um, at the top yeah, left. Well, uh, we have, this is great for, for our new radiologist, uh, Dr. Gibbs. She can jump in right away if that's okay. I was gonna, I was gonna um, volunteer Koi, Koi Than, because he's also the expert in our radiologist. But um, sure, I can do that. So on the, um, the top image, I don't know if we would see I don't know if we see anything there. There's a little bit too much prevertebral soft tissue swelling in front of the anterior arch of C1. But the next picture, it's pretty clear that you have um, widening of C1. We know that's going to be fractured because that um, C1, C2 articulation on each side is too wide. And your second picture over. Um, and so that there's no way that ring could be intact and be that wide and also that tall. If I can describe that without my arrow. I use arrows a lot. The one below that, I think there's a fracture, a couple of fractures on the right. You have a little chip next to the endontoid base. And then maybe also in the C1 on the right there too. I'm not sure if that goes all the way through or not. That little line on the right. And then of course, your last image, you've got, this is a congenital non-union in the back, not a fracture, but in the front, you've obviously got two fractures there on each side. How's that? Sounds great. I think that uh, that tells a story. Would you try and classify this or do you think that classification uh, when it comes to C1 ring injuries really is not relevant? Um, so I might try to classify it and I, I was going to even create a talk using the new AO spine uh, classification system for this part, but I haven't yet. I only have the subaxial cervical spine. So tell us what it is. Well, again, I think that, uh, you know, I think the typical response from ER docs, from radiologists is, oh, it's a Jefferson fracture. Every C1 fracture is a Jefferson fracture. And I guess in, in my, I don't think the AO, to be honest, does a great job describing C1, C2 type fractures. I think that it really, 
um, some of the more classic uh, definitions are better. In my simplistic mind, it's sort of a, almost a burst type injury or what people re frequently refer to as a Jefferson fracture or else a unilateral sagittal split. And I think that beyond that, a lot of these things are irrelevant when it comes to the fracture pattern itself. I think you know a point of debate that I wanna discuss with everybody is sort of the implication of a TAL injury and whether that matters. So- and Rick, also, sorry, along that point, if I can ask a question, uh, well, how do you, uh, how do you, um, I guess, incorporate the law of Spence, which we all learn as, you know, residents and, and interns and medical students, you know, it was originally based on x-ray, it's that overhang, do we even, I mean, we just go straight to the coronal CT, right? I mean, how do you incorporate that into, into also uh, telling whether this is quote unquote stable or unstable? Well, I, I think, you know, I think you know, I'm a big fan of the history of classification and history of fractures. So if you look at the rule of Spence, that article came out in 1970. It was based on a single case that occurred in 1968. From that, they did a, a small series of cadaveric things and basically said, if there's overhang of more than 6.9 millimeters, it's unstable. And that was sort of their summary, but it was really poor data, um, as I think was frequently the case back in that era. But I think that to my mind today, um, it's, it's sort of irrelevant and 6.9 doesn't mean anything. You can have different forms of instability with less than 6.9. Um, and again, what are we really trying to classify? I, I think the rule of Spence was really trying to say that probably the TAL is disrupted. Um, and again, one of the things that I wanna discuss with everybody here is, is does the TAL matter? And if so, how do we treat this differently? So I'll show you a few more pictures on this one and maybe we can kind of come back to that, come full circle back to the rule of Spence and whether that matters. But I think uh, for those of you that are history buffs, um, an interesting paper to read as you kind of look at it from a 2020 perspective back 50 years ago when that article came out. So I guess my question to, to those on the panel, um, you know, do we want an MRI? Um, and if so, why? Uh, just for sort of people's perspective, if, they, if you had this gentleman uh, come into your emergency room and you were suddenly consulted on him. Holly, I'll defer yes. to you on who you Yeah, no, wanna... I think that's great. So what we'll do is we, like we always do, we'd like our participants to type in their response. What would you do if this were, you know, this came into your ER? We literally had the same exact question on a different type of injury last week, if I recall. Uh, and as we get response from the participants in which option they choose, maybe we can get some of our own faculty. Uh, Nader, what, there he is. Nader, what, what would you do? Which one of these would you pick and why? First thing, great case. Um, you know, I, I mean, my philosophy is um, even if an MR won't necessarily change the management, it's just, it's good to document, uh, you know, uh, disruption of the uh, transverse atlantal ligament. The other thing is like with more imaging is I wanna also image um, the vascular, uh, make sure that there's a ver no vert dissection. Oftentimes with these injuries, you may have a vertebral artery dissection and um, which necessitate further treatments with aspirin or anticoagulation. The third thing, there's a small chance of an, an epidural uh, hematoma. Looking at the stir at the level of the joints, the plantoaxial and the uh, uh, condylar uh, C1 joint is, is also good to look at in terms of if there's a stir signal change that maybe adds to the uh, significance of the injury. Now, uh, you know, if there's no increase in the uh, C1 uh, condylar interval or the C1, C2 uh, joint uh, space, uh, you wouldn't, you, you're, you're, not, you're not suspecting a dissociation on the CT scan, but it's good to determine and look at the capsular ligaments and the stir signal in these joints. But, um, but yeah, vascular imaging for sure. And yeah, I would favor an MRI. I'm not sure it's gonna change the management with these, uh, with these fractures. Um, it's interesting. I, I wanna interject here just cause Nader did say the same thing last week about the CTA. I've never seen people get CTAs unless there is a fracture through the foramen transverse area. So that's interesting on this case where there is none Unless you think there is another, well, we already know there's not another fracture in the CT. So well, I thought that that's an interesting addition to do both vascular and MRI. Yeah, um, our cohort that we looked at here at Northwestern, about 30% uh, will have a vertebral artery dissection with a <laughs> Jefferson a fracture or C1, a C1 fracture. That's great. I'm going to get that article and pass it around. 
And Dr. Dr. Bransford, did you show another picture, not the one you have here, but you showed a little picture with the chip that shows, didn't you show the little chip that shows that this ligament is probably disrupted? I don't know where that little chip on the right is coming from next to the odontoid base. That, usually right. you have a little chip, it's coming from somewhere related to a ligament. I think that that is coming, I think that's coming from this little spot over here where we're just sort of cutting it uh, uh, across So it's there. not a free little fragment. Okay. Right. So Rick, you're getting a lot of uh, one, two, and three. I did, I did not see any fours. So yes, okay. the fry is going to be uh, going to be ordered or going to have been ordered for us. So what did, what did you do? So um, you know, again, I, I think that uh, for right or wrong, and I, and maybe a little philosophical uh, insertion here, I think we run into dangers when we sort of say, "Here's a VIP that we change the protocol." And I think it can frequently get us into trouble when some people want VIP treatment as opposed to, you know, the resident, the ER should see them and sort of start from there as opposed to, well, we want the fellow or the attending or whatever to get involved. I think this happened in this case, they wanted the MRI. Um, and again, I'm not saying it's the right or wrong choice. However, uh, as you can imagine with this guy's size, he didn't fit in our MRI. And uh, he was uh, from a visiting team here in Seattle. And so an MRI was not obtained, not from lack of effort, but uh, purely because he was too large to fit uh, in the gantry. <laughs> so, so I guess, so now, um, you know, it begs the question, okay, we really desperately want an MRI. Do we send them out to some open MRI across town? Uh, again, this is a Saturday or this is a Sunday night game. So, you know, kind of the issues surrounding that. But let's assume that we can't get an MRI. Um, he's had a CT, he had a CTA, no overt vascular injury. Um, so uh, again, we're making some assumptions here, but I guess I'd be interested to know now, okay, what, what's, what is the treatment option that, uh, that those would pick uh, of the choices selected or is there something different that they would like to do? Yeah, definitely transfer, but uh, let's say that's- <laughs> Not an option. Uh, John, John, uh, John, John Chen uh, sees a lot of VIPs at MGH. I know he handles these very well. John, what, what's your thought on this? Or cool, um, feel free to jump in. Yeah, this is, this is tricky. I mean, I, I, regardless of his status, I mean, this is an operation I would consider um, C1, C2 at minimum. Um, I know that some have been doing sort of C1 reconstructions and uh, uh, sort of compressing and uh, doing a uh, fixation there, but I don't know, I, I would probably lean towards just a posterior fixation C1, C2. Jonathan, you're, uh, you're fresh out here into practice, year one and two in the Cleveland Clinic. What do you think uh, the gals and the guys there would do and what would you do? Yeah, I, I, I agree with John Shin. Um, there's almost certainly a uh, uh, disruption of the uh, transatlantic ligament there. So this is technically pretty unstable. But the, the main consideration for this guy is a football player. So, um, you know, he's going to want to get back to get, get back into playing. So the question is whether or not it's a career ending injury for him. Um, and, you know, and then what are the steps that we can take to prevent that from happening? Because the larger and more complex your construct, the less this guy's going to be like, likely to go back. Like so if you do an occiput to C2, he, he can't, go and, can't go back to playing football. So um, yeah, I, uh, I agree that, you know, that a, a C1 reconstruction would be ideal, um, although I've never actually seen that, so I wouldn't be comfortable attempting that, but I would lean towards a C1 too. And then with the halo, that is possible too, but he would, you know, he's going to wear that for months, he'll be out of, out of sport, it may not heal well. Um, I think the most controllable and reliable uh, result would be a C1 too. But that's not an easy decision to make. Okay. Um, so. Um, we, you know, can I say something? Uh, yeah, please. You're, you're muted now. Uh, Miami J color versus maximum halo. Probably I would lean to Miami J color mobilize them with that. You know, that's how, how I would treat these because, um, uh, you know, it's, he's not going to have a neurological deficit. It's playing outwards you know what i mean so we're not you know he's not gonna you know if you mobilize him with the color and he has significant pain he's not gonna you know like sublux or get a neurological deficit it's it's if it's gonna splay it's gonna splay outwards and it's gonna settle a little bit you're gonna get maybe some cranial settling but in my experience they will heal especially if he's young um but that's my experience okay 
So that's actually the option we went for. Um, we, I, well, I went for, I can't say we. Uh, I put him in a Miami J collar and uh, checked an upright and he was complaining of just horrible pain. He couldn't stand, you know, even sitting up in his bed. Um, again, trying to fit a, a collar or, you know, for that matter, we even considered a halo on a guy this size was uh, quite an undertaking. So this is what he looks like now. Um, he's, he's got his upright. He's got about eight millimeters of overhang on the right, five millimeters on the left. Again, you know, by if we're going back to the rule of Spence, uh, you know, this was unstable. But uh, I guess now with this information, we got eight and five millimeters, so a sum total of 13 millimeters. Um, it sounds like we already had some people vote for C1, C2 uh, posterior fusion. Anybody have a, another thought or continue with the collar or versus a halo? Yeah, I think, I mean, I think he's going to, I mean, he's going to be in pain if you have, if he gets an operation or not. I think if you committed to putting, uh, I love the fact that you showed the uprights, Rick, because I also mentioned that, I also typed that in. I really am a big fan of that, especially for the trainees. You know, you see a fracture, thoracolumbar, especially cervical, facet fracture, it looks benign. Don't send the patient out of the ER before you get an upright x-ray. You just want to see if there's any additional subluxation, and if not, or at least there's a little bit, you want to compare it to, say, the six-week or the three-month x-ray. But I think, in my opinion, if you committed him to a Miami J and the upright doesn't show any further, you know, worrisome subluxation, I would, I would commit to that for a little bit longer and bring him back, or I guess in this case, he'll fly, he'll fly back to his town for a short follow-up, just my personal opinion. Okay. So I was, uh, you know, I had a long talk with him. His wife was actually a nurse, uh, pregnant with their first child. So she had flown into town now. And uh, this is what I ended up doing. So here I did a C1 internal fixation. Uh, my usual C1 screws are between 28 and 30 millimeters. You can imagine a guy this size. Uh, these were unusual 36 millimeter screws, uh, 3.5 millimeter in diameter. And again, you know, my technique is sort of, I'll put a little bit of, I try and put a little traction on their head as they're positioned prone on a Jackson table. Uh, Mayfield pens pull a little bit and I think that helps reduce the ring to some degree and also stabilizes those unstable pieces I'm trying to drill. As you can imagine his bone was very hard and um, it was a bit of a challenge getting the drill to actually go through his bone just due to how um, how, how firm his bone was. But then you can see here on the left, uh, this intraoperative view, the screws uh, on each side, and then connected by this, in this case, a 3.5 rod. I think I would probably use a 4.0 rod today going between the screws. And uh, here he is on his post-op CT. Um, you can see, obviously, I couldn't, had no control over the front, but at least it's relatively well opposed. Uh, the screws coming beneath the, the occipital cervical joint and then here on the uh, coronal view, you know, kind of squeezed it back together uh, reasonably well. And at least, you know, his, his C1 is sitting properly on the C2 lateral masses. Um, I also, you know, he had that synchondrosis in the back. So I did try and decorticate that and put a little bit of bone graft in that to try and get that synchondrosis from his posterior C1 arch to try and heal up from a bony standpoint. Any thoughts or criticisms or, you know, this is the stupidest thing ever? <laughs> Beautiful. Hey, Dr. Bransford, it's, uh, hey, it's Koi Than. Um, I've got two questions for you. Um, one, can you talk about um, uh, ways to ensure that you have a good reduction um, uh, intraoperatively, just because, you know, your visualization, obviously, with x-ray is not going to be as good as, uh, uh, as on the CT? And I guess the second question is, can you maybe uh, talk about how this, um, I, I guess, conceptually, um, still works in the setting of, of a ligamentous injury? Sure. So the, in answer to the first question, I do think now we have, you know, techniques with O-arms and various uh, three-dimensional things where we actually probably can better assess this. This actually um, goes back about 10 years. And so I did not, we did not have an O-arm at the time, did not have an O-arm spin. And so it's sort of like, well, I'm doing the best I can. I do think the traction does help to pull those in to some degree. And then once that rod is seated and you, you can turn with um, some of these systems in, from a polyaxial head into a monoaxial head, you can provide little compression. Obviously it squeezes in the back and maybe centrically does not do as well in the front. I, I do think it's a little bit of a, um, maybe guesswork is maybe not the right term. But if I were to do this today with our O-arm, I would do an O-arm spin to get a better sense of, is this reduced well enough? Um, 
the other thing, you know, I'll come, I'll come back to that other issue with just a couple articles here. So I guess just to complete this, um, there's always the question of is his TAL intact? Um, here's his uh, top left is his uh, open mouth view. Here he is on flexion extension here on the right, uh, trying to demonstrate that we could not appreciate any overt C1, C2 instability. Um, we got a CT scan that was actually done back near his hometown, where you can see that the anterior arch is actually healed from a bony standpoint. Um, and I ended up taking out his hardware uh, at his request. His wife is a nurse with her pregnant with their first child said there's no way you're going to go back to playing in the NFL. You've already had a, you know, seven, eight year career. So, you know, I guess just to give a little literature background to this, this is an article we wrote. Uh, he was one of these cases. He's the unknown because we couldn't get the MRI here. But we had five intrasubstance tears and six avulsions. Um, and none of these, interestingly, when all was said and done, you know, my point number two, no C1, C2 instability based on flexion extension films and ADI on final follow-up of these pictures. Uh, we were able to get them reduced from an average of 7.1 millimeters um, on the coronal view down to about 2.4 millimeters, which you know was uh, we're pretty happy with. And most of these patients really had, you know, in our medium-term follow-up, uh, no significant uh, pain and you know regained some of their mobility. Um, besides our article, here's another article uh, that also describes 12 cases with Jefferson fractures. Interestingly, they had. Uh, seven with that they deemed to be intact TAL, five with avulsion, and again, similar good range of motion, all fractures healed on CT, and uh, again, no obvious instability on those. I think one of the things that we regularly discuss, and I'd be interested to hear, you know, Wendy, your perspective on this, is that, you know, trying to actually truly see a, can I identify an intra, intrasubstance tear of a TAL without a, you know, on any MRI, unless it's sort of a dedicated C1, C2 MRI, there always seems to be some debate and how, ac how accurate do you believe you can be with that diagnosis? Um, yeah, that's a very tough area. And, but where you are with my friend, Mamu Mosabasha, Yep. He, he probably has your uh, imaging as you probably have the best imaging possible around. So you probably get some good pictures of that. I think we can say, you know, pretty well, if there's increased signal, you don't know for sure, but also even by the positioning on the CT, like this picture you have on the screen right now, we know that's not a normal physiologic position of, of the odontoid in the ring. So we know that's going to be disrupted. So it's not just the signal itself. I think that's for tough cases, but there are other clues we can look for. I don't know, that kind of gets around your question a little bit, but. Um. Yeah. Well, I think our, our theory, you know, based on, you know, back to our study is that I don't, I don't hang nearly as much weight on the TAL as I used to. And I think that in these particular injuries with it's a, it's an axial load injury and whether the TAL is disrupted or not, I think that, you know, this is different from other pathologies such as rheumatoids where, you know, they're wearing down everything over time. They may tear through things. They have a widened ADI. I think in these tend to be younger people with traumas, with being an axial load, I think their capsules are probably more intact and maybe will tighten up over time so that even if their TAL is, remains disrupted, it may not be relevant actually to the long-term function or I, maybe I can't say long-term, medium-term function of their C1 on C2. And I think, you know, again, I think this is uncharted territory and I think we still have a lot to learn. But uh, I think when it comes to the TAL, at this point, based on sort of our experience, I don't really look, I, I could, I'm not bothered if they have an intrasubstance tear. Um, uh, again, if it's in true axial load type injury. So I don't know if there's- um, Go ahead. Oh, sorry, just a quick question. And, and I, I don't wanna put you on the spot. These are tough questions, but, but, but you know, his wife really made that decision for you as far as not going back to playing football. Um, you know, what would you say to him if he said, can I go back to playing competitively in the NFL? And when can I do that? Uh, without going through like all the subaxial literature and everything, what, for this particular case, what would, how do you handle that? And what, what would you say? Yeah, I, I told him and I told numerous trainers, numerous team physicians, you know, I, I, you can't believe the number of, of conversations you can have about an NFL player. I said, you know, he, we did not fuse anything. Um, he should have reasonable mechanics, but I think what they would need to document from a PT, from a trainer standpoint, is that he was able to restore um, relatively physiologic range of motion to allow him to absorb energies for, for future loads. And, you know, you could potentially argue that, you know, if his fracture heals in the front and we can get that synchondrosis to heal in the back, 
um, that potentially he's more stable now from a purely from a C1 ring injury um, than he was before. And so my, my take on that was, you know, he can go back to playing football if, if, if his documentation is that his range of motion and his core strength of his neck is acceptable to, by, based on their criteria that I don't know all about. Rick, I don't know if, I don't know if that's the right answer. range of motion? Like, I mean, like um, even in patients who heal uh, with the Miami J color or with like osteosynthesis, like what you did, I don't see them like uh, having full range of motion long term. Like they still have uh, loss of range of motion in the axial um, uh, uh, plane. Yeah, I, I do agree with you. I, I think that, you know, operative or non-operative, I think they do lose range of motion just from the scarring, um, you know, maybe from the surgery if we're doing a C1 osteosynthesis. You know, it is interesting in this article that they very clearly say they, they're good functionally with and with range of motion. That's something we did not look, la look at in our study, but my um, non-scientific observation is in, then that most of these patients do not get their full range of motion. Um, and if you look at the literature out of Vancouver, treated non-operatively, you know, these patients really do have some long-standing pain associated with it, which, you know, we seem to have less pain actually with our surgeries than the ones that actually we don't. Again, it's a little bit maybe comparing apples to oranges, but uh, that's kind of our sense. All right, well, let me go if, uh, if it's okay with our, um, with Ollie, I'll go on to the next case. Um, again, I think this one, the, the purpose of this one is to sort of highlight what can happen. Uh, so this case, he's a 50 year old male, a bipolar alcoholic uh, on a Monday, uh, just to give some perspective, he had an injury to his neck. I do not have those injury films available as they were taken at outside hospital after he had an alcoholic seizure. For the patient, when he came to us, he was neurointact except for some numbness. And that Tuesday, uh, the day after his injury, he had gone to the operating room at an outside facility where he underwent a C67A CDF. Interestingly, after their ACDF that was done uh, Tuesday, the 6th of September, 2011, this was the imaging they had afterwards um, that uh, documented that the, there's the plate, there's the graft, um, and you can interpret the rest the way you want. So. Any thoughts on this? Uh, what you would do at this point? Is this okay? You send the guy out. Um, I'll, I'll open that up to the panel. Jonathan, uh, what do you think, Jonathan? I, can, I, I mean, I'm, I'm going to leave this up to you. But the first thing that I would do is pick up the phone and talk to the surgeon and get her or his thought on uh, how he presented. And that's definitely the first thing I would do because I'm not sure this is heading in the right direction. Right. <laughs> All right what are your thoughts, Jonathan? I, I, I totally agree. Actually, this looks perfect to me. There's nothing wrong. Send him home. <laughs> I'm just, I'm just kidding. I'm not going to say anything. No. Uh, so he, I'm, I'm assuming this, this gentleman has poor medical follow-up. He probably has no prior images available. Um, you know, no, no cervical imaging available. So you're, you're kind of just left in between a rock and a hard place on what you want to do. Cause obviously it's a difficult patient. He's um, has numerous psychosocial um, issues combined with very real pathology on his uh, CAT scan. So what you can see is um, it looks like he's he basically has, he doesn't never formed a solid fusion in his ACDF graft. Uh, his plate is also riding very high there. That's just more of a stylistic thing. Um, and then if you look at the, the, um, the parasagittal images, it looks like he has perched facet on the left. Um, it, that may even be fused. I'm not exactly sure. And then uh, on the right side, <clears throat> it looks like he's fractured through um, with a uh, super articulating process fracture and uh, probably uh, some element of a jump facet there. So I guess just to again put this in perspective, this CT is done the day of his surgery. So the, the ACDF was done, I don't know, four hours, six hours earlier. Now you have this imaging. If you're the operating surgeon, oh. what, what would you do? So this is not, this is not like, oh, we're months down the road. This is the day of. Oh, okay. Okay. Sorry. I didn't, I didn't quite do that. Okay. Um, yeah. So that's, this is not good. So uh, this, this is, I'm assuming it's a post-op. This is a fresh post-op. This is immediately post-op. Okay. Okay. So uh, yeah. So, okay. So what I would do in this case and the patient's neurologically and neuro attacks have some numbness for the patient. Okay. I, I would, um, I would, I would just take this patient back to the OR. Yeah. I, I wouldn't, uh, I wouldn't um, get an MRI. There's no point really. I would just take it back to the OR for uh, probably a, a front back. So you'd revise the front and do something from yeah. the back as well? Yeah. yeah. Okay. Any other thoughts from anybody or? 
All right. Well, maybe for sake of time, I'll, I'll push on. So again, I, this was Tuesday, the 6th of September. Five days later, so the, the guy was sent home Friday. Um, two days after he's at home, he's walking. He felt a pop in his neck, had weak arms, and fell to the floor um, and returned via ambulance to his um, to the hospital where he was fixed the first time. So now here he is five, uh, six days after his index, op, index injury, five days after his index procedure. And now he has this uh, parasagittal or, or uh, sagittal CT scan uh, showing this image. With a central cord type picture, his uh, legs are, are intact. He's got some weakness of his intrinsics and some of his distal uh, upper extremity motor groups. So now what? Yeah, I think uh, this this guy keeps getting into uh, more trouble. I mean, I, I agree with Jonathan. He should have been, you know, it's always hard to look at your own scans after and, and commit a patient back to the OR, but they really should have done that because this was almost predictable um, with, with non-reduced, uh, basically bilateral jumped or perched. I, can't, I, can't, I couldn't remember, but really jumped the sets with just uh, an ACDF. Uh, yeah, I mean, jumped and fractured on one side, fractured, uh, perched on the other side, that's all hinging on that plate and screws. I mean, this, this is a disaster, but I would do the same thing I would have done the first time, which is taken to the, back to the OR under neuromonitor traction, intraoperative traction and a front back revision. Uh, what about now? Now that there's a lot of cervicals. So what would you do now with this, now that uh, he has this picture? Yeah, I would, have, I, I, I would still uh, do intraoperative traction and, uh, uh, I'd have to see the back, but sometimes you may need to release those facets if they're just completely bilaterally jumped. But this is a 360 revision with intraoperative traction for me personally. Corey, Corey are you still with us, right? Where yeah, I'm, I'm still here. Um, so, you know, I think this is a, uh, obviously a tough situation. Um, I agree with Ali on um, the use of traction, um, followed by uh, removal of instrumentation, um, C7 corpectomy, uh, inner body graft, and then you know, C, um, you know, C5 to T2 from the back or so. Okay. Anybody think that they could uh, get away with this with just a single approach instead of a 360 or is that uh, ridiculous? Uh, I mean, I, I'll vote ridiculous. I think uh, <laughs> you put them in traction and then see what you get and then, um, and then uh, go from there. You know, if it, it perfectly reduces, then you can maybe get away with a, with a, uh, with a posterior only, but my fear is the guy is intact and positioning him with uh, with this three column injury and doing a posterior only, even if he reduces, he may sublux while positioning him, unless you lock him in a halo vest if he reduces and then do it posterior. But yeah, I think traction and then front back, the safest. Okay. So um, we took him to the operating room that night. So this is Sunday night, uh, kind of went through the night. Uh, we tried in traction, he wouldn't reduce. So came in, used his old incision that uh, is five days old, uh, removed the C6-7 plate in that graft, um, tried to reduce him, but again, um, given the amount of uh, spondyloptosis and, uh, and collapse, and then given the, the C7 vertebral body, I, I really couldn't get him back on top um, despite using cobs and, uh, lamina spreaders and everything else. So I ended up taking out the plate, taking out the graft. He's still dislocated. Uh, then we turned him prone. Uh, we're able to do a posterior reduction, instrumented from C4 to T2, uh, did a laminectomy, and then turned it back over, opened that up. I did a C7 corpectomy and uh, an ACDF effort with a plate from C6 to T1. And his, his exam basically remained relatively unchanged uh, when he woke up. So this is sort of what his construct looks like um, afterwards, I've got uh, instrumentation from C4 down to T2. I got this cage in where his C7 vertebral body was and uh, reconstructed him in that way. And here's what he, what he looks like. So um, overkill, underkill, um, any thoughts on that? I think so, it's well done. I think uh, the follow-up to the study is uh, in conclusion, you know, he ended up, I get a call from his lawyer about probably six months to a year down the road. Um, hey, what do you think? You know, do you think this was managed correctly? Uh, any thoughts on this? And ultimately uh, the patient ended up settling with the hospital and his, uh, his prior surgeon. Um, 
interestingly, uh, and the way I know that is from his, his father who I ended up operating on, but uh, they ended up settling as opposed to going to court and probably settled for a lot more, a lot less than they could have uh, because the guy felt that he was a little bit responsible since he had an alcoholic seizure that started this whole uh, process in the first place. Um, just a, a couple of articles, just to- Rick, uh, Rick sorry, okay. just, just a couple of questions from the, uh, from the participants. Um, Dr. Adele is asking, did you check for the you know, vertebral arteries? Did you any, do any vascular study? Uh, I don't recall. I'm sure he would have gotten, our, our protocol in our emergency department is to get a CTA on anybody that has any uh, dislocation or anything like that. I, I'm sure he did. To be honest, I, I apologize. I don't recall whether he had an injury and the severity of a vascular injury. But you would recommend that uh, just because of the degree of subluxation, correct? Correct. Um, Again, I think, you know, when it comes to, there's a few articles that are out there. I think, you know, back in, in the prior days, and obviously still a point of debate, do we do close reduction for our more routine uh, jump facets, our F4 type injuries, or open reduction? I think there's an increasing body of literature suggesting that uh, there is a role for uh, anterior reduction of these cervical dislocations um, and some techniques, you know, using uh, with placement of our Casper pins in various angles, uh, lamina spreaders, cobs in combination with traction and various vectors with that. Um, and I tried some of these tricks, but it didn't work in, in this kind of more uh, egregious case. I think, you know, this is a, an article that I, uh, to me has always been very important. Uh, the radiographic failure of single segment anterior cervical plate fixation. Most of these are flexion type injuries. Um, we can frequently get these reduced either open or closed. And then it begs the question, we all prefer to do an ACDF over something posteriorly. I think it's, it's better for us, it's better for the patient, but sort of predictors of failure. And if you look at this uh, study that came out in, in 2004 by uh, out of the Vancouver group, um, they found that risk factors were facet fractures as this guy had. Um, obviously this guy wasn't reduced either. And more critically even than facet fractures are the superior in plate fractures. I think we really have to be looking quite carefully for. And again, they had a 13% failure rate with ACDFs in, in their patient uh, uh, group. We did a similar study, one of our previous fellows, um, a smaller group, but we had an 8% failure rate and all three patients in retrospect had an in plate fracture uh, that, was, that correlated with that. Uh, we, again, with fewer failures, we did not find an overt correlation with facet fractures. And this is one of our, ours that, uh, or pardon me, this is not one of ours, but I think, you know, biomechanically, these are better fixed with posterior, but many of these we can also treat with anteriorly. So I think for many of these, it's dealer's choice, but there's a lot of technical components of a smaller graft, really lordosing them, trying to ideally use a, a fixed angle plate, trying to use longer screws if at all possible. And this is one of ours that, that did fail uh, out of our series that we published. And if you look at this, you can see that there's maybe a hint of a subtle in plate fracture there. Uh, you can see the, the facet fracture as well. Uh, just a little chip on, on this left side, uh, clearly a little chip on that right side as well uh, once this was reduced. And this one, um, three weeks postoperatively, the patient came back with a central cord and ended up undergoing a revision from a single level ACDF. And you can see uh, on this middle film here, just sort of that failure is the graft just sort of settled and the screws couldn't hold in that um, a violated vertebral body from the injury itself. So I think again, when it comes to routine jump facets, um, obviously we gotta get them reduced, which was never done in this case, but um, look for the facet fracture um, and whether it's significant or not, and certainly look for the associated vertebral body uh, fractures as well. I think other factors are, are you know, look for patients that have ankylospine, spine, um, don't wanna go from the front, osteoporosis probably don't wanna go from the front, and maybe cases that are more at C7, T1, uh, those ones as well, uh, just to be aware of, so. Any thoughts or questions or any additional input uh, from any of the panel? Can I speak? Um, so, you know, I mean, the, the philosophy is, I mean, with, my philosophy at least with, with managing uh, unstable fractures is if you want to err, err on doing more than less. Uh, why? Because um, if those sometimes fail, patients may end up with a neurological deficit and the fix may be more challenging. So if you're not sure, should I go posterior long segment versus short segment, go long segment. Uh, that's, that's my general impression when I, when I manage uh, fractures, as opposed to degen. Degen, you know, you, know, you want to be a minimalist, you know, find where the pain is coming from and uh, address that. And, uh, uh, but with, with fractures, uh, because if, 
if you miss on an unstable injury or you don't do enough for a significantly unstable injury, then, then the result can be uh, paralysis or uh, kyphosis and the fix is much more difficult. I think that's a great point. That, that's a great point, Nader. Uh, Rick, one question before you go to the third case, if you don't mind. I'm going to pick your brain on the uh, choice of anterior cervical implants. Uh, in trauma or in degen, is there a difference? Do you favor one or the other? When do you use a peak titanium allograft uh, versus uh, the different types of plating for trauma versus non-trauma? Just your, your general practice of anterior cervical. Sure. So I think for the, the DGEN, um, those patients, as a general rule, are intrinsically stable. But I think the traumas, I do try and use a fixed angle. You know, this is a locking plate, and so the screws do lock in. Um, we have a set that actually has extra long screws, so I tend to go longer, even bicortical in some cases, if there's enough room in the canal. Um, I try and, you know, certainly for jump facets, uh, really lordose that segment to really make sure that the facets are, are locked in uh, to try and provide some extra stability. I uh, use a small graft as opposed to a bigger graft to try and really collapse that down. Um, so those are some of the things that I think make a difference because I think... Um, I think we get into trouble. Obviously, again, this one highlights that we have to reduce these in the first place, but even in, in a reduced uh, um, fracture, they still can become unstable because everything in the back is ripped out on these. And so I think some of these small things can actually make a big difference. And maybe that's why we only had an 8% failure rate and, and have learned from some of the, our previous uh, problems and stuff that other people have done. So third case here, um, uh, this was more of a delay. So this was a 40 year old female. Uh, she had had two prior cervical surgeries uh, for neck pain, arm issues. Last one was about a year and a half before. And you can see this uh, plate uh, cage construct, um, some metal inner body device here. Interestingly, she moved shortly after her surgery. Um, I'm out in Seattle. So she was down in the Boise area, but moved up north to um, uh, to the northern part of Idaho. So she didn't follow up with her surgeon, but she fell about three months after her surgery and then just basically felt like her neck was gradually collapsing. She was seen, then seen by her local primary care doctor, uh, had a 50 pound weight loss, really felt that she was like a vulture with her neck kind of pitched forward, um, but she's neurologically intact. And so this is the presenting uh, film that she came with. And uh, we'll let this video play here to kind of give you hopefully a little bit of perspective on sort of where things are. So to my eye, um, you know, looks like she's mostly arthrodes there. Um, and this is sort of what she looks like in summary there. So um, again, counting the levels, here's her T3 vertebral body. Her plate previously came down to a T2. Um, but then it's sort of, you can see the, where that rests with respect to the T2 body. And I'll leave it to your judgment. Is this arthrodist? Uh, is this side arthrodist? Uh, again, she's now about nine months out or, or a year out from uh, when she had the fall. So um, thoughts or questions or any further interpretation? She's neurologically intact, um, 40 years old, hates her neck position, and is having a hard time eating and is losing weight. Yeah, I, I, that's, uh, that's a tough case, Rick. I, I, I think if she's healthy enough to undergo a revision and, and uh, you know, I think, I think the sooner the better because I, I'm not sure if it's enclosed or not. I think the facets, you, you'd be surprised. I mean, I, I think you will get some, you know, a little bit of motion there and I, I would err on revising it sooner uh, than later. Um, and if you can't reduce that with traction, it's going to be impossible, in my hands, it's going to be impossible to take the bottom part of the plate from an, if you start anteriorly. She needs to be either significantly reduced uh, before you go anterior or release from the back, further reduce, and then go to the front and take. I mean, I, I probably go back front, back in this personally with intraoperative traction uh, as well. Uh, what do the others think, John, uh, John or Coy? What are your thoughts on this? Hey, it's Coy here. Um, you know, I think uh, maybe there's suggestion that, uh, you know, she's not uh, uh, completely arthritis, you know, towards the bottom. You know, there's some uh, shadow around the plate there, and at least uh, on the cuts that we have in the video I saw, I didn't really think the facets were arthritis. So I think this might be a, a, a patient that's reasonable um, to admit preoperatively for, for traction, obviously with close uh, neurologic uh, monitoring. Uh, and then um, if you get some reduction, then uh, maybe something like a... Um, 
uh, a front and back where you're uh, taking out the plate. Um, looks like probably needs a, a, a one, two corpectomy and then, you know, long segment fixation from the back. Um, uh, looks like the um, level maybe just clears the sternum. So you might uh, need to do a, a maneuverectomy, but um, I, I agree if you don't get much uh, correction in the way of traction, um, this might be a, a quite a big undertaking back front back. Wendy, as our token radiologist, uh, how would you interpret this? Do you think she's fused or do you think that there's uh, she's still mobile there? I don't know. It's it's hard to tell. Um, I, I maybe if you went through that video again, I can't really say from from this. But yeah, somebody mentioned though dynamic X-rays. I don't know if quite. Sorry, I, I missed it if if Coy just said that. Can very gently can't we see on flex and extension if she's moving? Is that an answer? So I actually did get flexion extension. I apologize, I didn't load those up. I couldn't really elicit, again, it was sort of hard to see given the fact that this was more at the T2, T, T3 location between her, her shoulders, her scapulas and everything, but it, there was no obvious motion there. And Dr. Malvagani also had a good point that MRI might show um, some edema there too. I think that was what he was, unless he was referring to another case. You can also see some increased, um, if, there's, if there is motion, chronic motion at that level, you'll see it on MRI as well trying to incorporate something from the chat here, but I might've been too late. All right, so um, I guess some of the parameters we, we look at. So um, she did get an MRI, there was no, again, she's neuro intact. So we weren't really looking for a root compression, spinal cord compression, although we wanted to kind of know where that kind of sat. But, you know, we tried traction, she really didn't move at all. So ankylosed essentially the best we could tell from C4 to T2. She's got no neuro issues um, using some of the parameters that are desc described, cervical lordosis, she's got about 33 degrees. She's hyperlordotic if we look at the normal parameters as she's trying to compensate to get her head looking forward. Her chin brow angle is about 24 degrees, um, should be around zero degrees. And people frequently refer to, you know, sort of the pelvic incidence of the cervical thoracic junction is a thoracic inlet angle that should be around 70 degrees. And she's measuring about 130 degrees here on these films. So I guess um, maybe for the sake of time, um, you know, Ali, I think you said that, uh, you know, you would probably do a release from the back. Um, does anybody, I guess, does anybody want to take a pick of start from the front? Um, or anybody we did have, yeah, Rick, we did have somebody from the chat. I think it was also uh, Alex who said uh, possibly maneuverectomy or even a sternotomy and potentially starting from the front. Um, I can tell you in, in having done a few sternotomies uh, for cancer, it's hard to go down below T3, you know, T2, T3 from the front. Um, that's why, I, and the angle to just to get that screw out of the bottom plate, the angle is even steeper than that. So I still think you have to get some reduction before you go from the front. But yes, yeah, somebody did suggest starting from the front through a, uh, a modified maneuverectomy or sternotomy. And if you're starting from the back, like what are you gonna do? You're just gonna do, just whack out everything until you can get her lined up or? Yeah, I think releasing those facets, especially down between say C7 and T3, C7 and T2, where we're not sure if she's enclosed from the front or not. I think if we release some of those facets, I, I believe it'll be easier to reduce intraoperatively and then when you go back from the front. I, that's what I would put all my screws, uh, probably C2 down to T4 at least, depending on what her thoracic spine looks like, uh, release as many facets as possible, then go back to the front. Okay. Anybody else have a, a thought of a different different approach? Okay. So um, I guess we sort of discussed these things. So this is what I, what I did, you know, similar to what Ollie described. I, I, we didn't get her to move much on traction. So came in from the back, uh, placed screws at T3, T4, T5 distal, um, went up to C4 uh, on the back and essentially began to work, uh, tip down her T2 pedicles on each side um, and just tried to excavate everything out from here until we could actually see the tip of this screw here from her ACDF and removed everything, you know, kind of from time to time, you know, releasing her head that was held in Mayfield pens to try and um, see what she would do in terms of alignment. Um, and eventually, you know, got her in this position here, you can see on the right. 
this is sort of what she looks like on her CT scan. So I couldn't really get a cage in there. And so this is actually a teep lift graft here, um, an allograft here that's sort of resting on the inferior side of the cage that's in there. Uh, again, these screws here at T3. So essentially her T2 body is removed and likely some component of T1. You can see here on the right film that it's not really a smooth angle here, but this was all done from the back and sort of called it a day at that point in time. So I thought fairly reasonable correction. So uh, we did that. So the, the day after surgery, uh, she, you know, she's saying that every time the nurse dumps her drain, it smells like sulfur. Um, and everybody were sort of like, well, okay, you know, the drain has been hooked off. So we undid the drain and sure enough, it smelled like sulfur. So any, any thoughts on what to do now? And I guess given this construct, would anybody, you know, maybe with or without the drain smelling like sulfur, would you say that this is sufficient? or is she still gonna need some support from the front? So this was, so this was only posterior approach, uh, Rick, and basically you saw her alignment has improved, her hardware looks intact. Your plan was just to keep her as is, correct? Well, we, I sort of had left that open-ended. So, um, uh, and so again, you know, let, let's assume I did this case, you know, earlier today, we got the CT scan, I'm asking you guys for your input, you know, would you call this good enough? Or would you say, boy, that's sort of a tenuous construct, you know, yeah, she's got a lot of screws in the back, and she's a petite lady with a BMI of 19. But is there any hope that this is going to go on to heal uh, with what's in there right now? I say from the front, no healing. Okay. Uh, Ali agrees. <laughs> so that made my day. Thank you. <laughs> Anybody think that's enough? Anybody have a theory on the sulfur smell? Let's see what the folks say. It looks like in the chat box, uh, you know, Dr. Adelaide, Dr. Dugano said they, they, they say it looks good like that, but something obviously has you worried. I'm not sure about that sulfur smell or where that's coming from personally, you know. Uh, I don't know. Help us out, what would happen? Anybody have a theory on the sulfur? So um, I think, you know, given the, given the smell of sulfur, I, I think my thought was, uh-oh, I, I didn't think I was out of bounds, but did I nail her esophagus? Is, is her esophagus leaking? And now it's sort of tracking all the way through because that whole anterior segment now connects through the back because I've done a full corpectomy, you know, via costal transversectomy type approach. Um, and it continued, you know, for a couple of days. I also was a little worried about um, the construct here. So I talked to one of my ENT colleagues and said, well, you know, if I'm going to do something from the front, I'm likely going to have to get that whole plate out. So I'm going to need exposure from, you know, C4 all the way down to T3 anteriorly. Uh, again, some of the saving grace in her is that uh, she was relatively thin. So um, took her, took her, maybe before I jump to that, and that's a distraction, I took, took her back to the operating room with uh, the, the help of an ENT surgeon. Um, he, gave, he gave me a great exposure from C4 all the way down to, to T3 from the front. Um, during the exposure, he's like, you know, right up here at C4, he says the, esoph the esophagus is leaking. And he says, you know, this looks old. He says, my, my theory, uh, again, I'll emphasize the word theory, is that he says, I think what happened is that as you corrected her alignment, is that this, this tear had likely walled off. And, and was okay, but then when you realigned her, you probably ripped off some of the scar, stretched her esophagus and opened it up. But we couldn't find any evidence of an esophageal injury down at the T1, T2 area where I've been working, but she did have one up at C4, C5. So I, I reconstructed her with this. So you can see here now that the plate has been removed from the front and on the left side, you can see this video tracking uh, with the expandable cage that I put in there that again is a little bit oversized, but uh, given her her um, given her anatomy. Um, but essentially we took off that plate in the front, uh, put in this and he took the sternocleidomastoid from the left side and, and he repaired the esophagus and then used the sternocleidomastoid to wrap around um, the esophagus to give it vascularity and create a bit of a barrier. And then he took one of the strap muscles and I can't recall which one he did exactly and sort of folded it down to cover over the front of the cage to try and create a barrier uh, from the anterior to the posterior through here. And this is sort of what she, this is what her final alignment looks like. Um, so she essentially went from this film on the left to sort of this film on the right and then sort of the x-rays here. 
but I think, you know, my, my theory, and I think that uh, this, this was maybe found a little bit too on what we found anterior is that the sulfur smell um, that really did smell like sulfur was her esophageal contents leaking from the front, tracking down through um, the retropharyngeal space and exiting out through that, you know, void from the back from her posterior surgery coming out the drain. And I guess, you know, so the saving grace is that at least by taking her from the front too, you know, we at least avoided a, a significant mediastinitis and potential death in her from an esophageal injury that uh, I don't think I caused in the first place given its location, but I think I, I ripped open maybe something that was lying in there um, waiting to be disrupted again. That's a, that's a, that's a definitely one heck of a case, Rick, for sure. It reminds me when, uh, you know, when, when we're thinking of doing laterals and putting in these huge cages to, 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 you know, if somebody has significant calcifications in the aorta to be careful because you can get a dissection just from the distraction. It's just the mechanisms sometimes are very, very odd. Um, first of all, I mean, I just want to say this is a great construct. I'm so happy to see a, a, uh, an expert orthopedic surgeon using titanium cages and expandable cages. <laughs> Cause I'll tell you one thing as a neurosurgeon, every time I show, I, I show these to others, uh, you know, the orthopods are like, oh, you have to use allograft. You have to use structural allograft. These, these things don't fuse. So I'm, I'm, I feel vindicated here, which is great. Um, any comments? Uh, Wendy, Nader, Jonathan? Love the C7 pedicle screws. Are these C7 pedicle screws, uh, Rick? They are C7 pedicle screws, you, yes. So how do you put them? Do you use navigation or do you do a laminotomy or freehand them? I freehand them. And yeah, I think, you know, again, with all the subaxial trauma we see here, we, you know, I put in a, quite a few C7 pedicle screws trying to keep, you know, appropriate constructs short and try and save motion. But yeah, I think that there's a, you know, the C7 is a, a beautiful, C7 pedicles are, it's a beautiful pathway and a, a, certainly a strong bite. And so I use a lot of C7 pedicle screws. Uh, no, great. And they line up well with the um, uh, lateral mass screws as well as the pedicle screws. I thought the entry point is a bit lateral. This is beautiful. Yeah, I try and, uh, you know, and in, in for constructs, whether in degen or trauma, I really pay careful attention. And I always will put in my C7 pedicle screws, which I think have to be very precisely placed before the others. I think we have some... Um, mobility in terms of where we put our lateral mass screws, which we don't have with our pedicle screws. And so if I get those in first, then I can kind of say, well, maybe my C6 or C5 lateral mass screws are going to be a little bit more lateral than they otherwise would be. But at least that way I can keep my construct in line. Rick, did you have to leave the patient on long-term IV antibiotics or to decrease the chance of an infection or how did you guys handle that? So we, we did get our infectious disease con, uh, uh, colleagues involved. You know, they did recommend that, um, you know, given her esophageal injury, given, I think it was hard for us to know exactly how much her, this fluid had infiltrated, not only her posterior tissues, but down into her mediastinum, that she was on IV antibiotics for six weeks. She was. Yeah, that makes sense. Well, that, that's absolutely terrific. Okay, well, it looks like we hit, that was, that was timed perfectly, Rick. Thank you so much. Obviously, masterful cases, uh, we always learn something here. This was absolutely fantastic. If nobody else has any further questions, uh, Dr. Dadele is going to present uh, next week's uh, speaker. So uh, next week's speaker will be uh, Dr. Tyler Koski, and he'll be speaking about uh, modern spine surgery, maximizing outcomes through continual advancement. So he's going to go over how he... Um, uh, started with a specific technique, let's say the T-lift, and over the years, how he made, he, with the continuing thought processes on how to make it more efficient, better biomechanics, less invasive, how it started, how it ended. Uh, it's a beautiful talk, and I look forward to us hosting him next week. He's a terrific uh, spine uh, deformity surgeon, but he's uh, pretty robust. He does a lot of minimal invasive and he's really uh, innovates into spine and I'm, I'm sure you're going to enjoy his talk uh, next week. Wonderful. Thanks, Nader. Yeah, we, we all love Tyler. He's a great spinal neurosurgeon, one of the uh, disciples of Steve Andra from back in the day. So I always love, love listening to him. Well, thank you, Rick. Thank you to our uh, faculty again here at uh, uh, the faculty host at Virtual Spine and the participants, of course. Uh, stay tuned uh, uh, on social media for our flyers out for next week. We'll see everyone next Thursday and have a great week, everyone. Thank you, Rick. Thank, Thank you, everybody. Thank you, Rick. Appreciate it. Take care. Have a good evening or day. Thank you. Bye-bye.